Turn to Genesis chapter 35. I've entitled the message for this evening, Reuben, Unstable as Water. Genesis 35, verse 21. And Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. And it came to pass, when Israel dwelt in that land, that Reuben went and lay with Billa his father's concubine. And Israel heard. Now the reason I didn't open the service with that verse of scripture is because while we were singing the songs and while we were praying, I was afraid people would think, what's he going to go with there on that verse of scripture? And uh, I thought it best to not open with that verse. Uh, but it is the uh, inspired word of God. This sordid event is not passed over, but recorded. And this is another example to us of how the Bible is the word of God. Only the Bible will record things of this nature of believers. I wouldn't. You wouldn't either. You wouldn't want your deeds to be recorded for everyone to see. I'm sure Reuben didn't either. But here we have it. And this action was just as sinful and perverted then as it is now. It's not like the it was okay back then because it wasn't. It was just as sinful then as it is now. Some have maintained that this was Reuben's rebellion against his father Jacob. Do you remember when Absalom rebelled against David? And he went and lay with his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel to show his rebellion and contempt for his father. This could have been Reuben doing the same. I don't know. But Jacob spake of this event in his final prophecy concerning his sons. Would you turn with me to Genesis 49? Verse 3, he speaks of all 12 of his sons, and he begins with Reuben, his firstborn. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it. He went up to my couch. Now, as the firstborn, the Messiah should have come through him, but he didn't because of this event that is recorded for us. And next, it could have, should have come to, he should have come through Simeon or Levi, but that didn't happen either. Look in verse 5. Simeon and, Le, Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O oh, my soul, come not thou unto their secret. Unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man. And in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was a cruel. 
I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. The Messiah would not come through these men either. It came through Judah. And if anybody thinks that's because of Judah's pure life, read Genesis 38, and that will dispel that myth. The next time we read of Reuben is when he found mandrakes, aphrodisiacs, and gave them to his mother. That's weird. I don't know how else to say that. And she took them and she used them to... uh, Uh, use leverage to sell to Rachel in order to get Rachel to let Jacob come into her. That's strange stories of Reuben, this one who's unstable as water. Turn to Genesis 42. Now Reuben was the one son who did not want to kill Joseph. All the rest of them wanted to kill him. That's certainly commendable, but look in Genesis 42. Verse 37. And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I'll bring him to thee again. Now this was Benjamin. You'll remember the story. (laughs) Jacob didn't want to send Benjamin down. And Reuben said, I'll take responsibility for him, and if I fail you, you can kill my two sons. As if that's what Jacob would want to do. Uh, that lets you know how uh, twisted he was in his thinking. He didn't say, you can kill me, but he said, you can kill my two sons. And then Jacob replies in verse 38, and he said, my son shall not go down with you. (laughs) I love the way he says that. He's not going down with you. For his brother is dead, and he's left alone. If mischief befallen by the way in which you go, then shall you bring my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. He knew Reuben enough to know that he was not going to send Benjamin with him. Now let's go back to Genesis 49 for a moment. Reuben. This language sounds almost strange, doesn't it, knowing how he felt about Reuben. And it almost seems like there's an element of sarcasm in it. I'm not sure that there's not. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. (coughs) And here's what comes of my might my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power, unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel. You're not going to succeed at anything. You can't be trusted. So you see why I think that there's an element of sarcasm. The scripture uses sarcasm. Uh, Elijah used sarcasm, mocking the false prophets. So I think that there is room for that, much room for that in the scripture. And I think Jacob, Jacob knew himself. When he gave uh, the summary of his life, he said, few and evil have been the days of the life of my pilgrimage. I've not attained to my father's. He knew that. And when he was saying this of Reuben, he knew Reuben. And he makes this statement with regard to Reuben, unstable as water, thou shalt not Excel. Reuben, you're so unstable. And that word means light and frothy, foam, water. You're so unstable that you will take the shape of any vessel you're poured into. You don't have any strength of character. You're light and frothy so much for the excellency of dignity and the excellency of strength. You shall not excel. And here's why. You're unstable as water. Now, what's that mean? Unstable as water. Well, the best commentary on Scripture is what? Scripture. If you want to know what something means in the Scripture, see how it lines up with other Scriptures. And that's why I had us read James chapter 1. Would you turn back there? James chapter 1.
Verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom. Now the wisdom he is speaking of here is saving knowledge. The fear of God. That's the beginning of wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom. I don't know how many times I've read this passage of scripture and said, Lord, I I like it. Give it to me. If any of you lack wisdom. Now, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask the Lord for it. Isn't that encouraging? Let him ask the Lord for it. I love that scripture, you have not, because you ask not. Every one of us ought to be asking right now. Lord, you said if we ask for wisdom, you'd give it. I'm asking. You take the Lord at his word. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. You, everyone that asketh. Receive it. To him that knocks, it shall be opened. That's the promise of Scripture. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. Now notice the word men is in italics. He gives to all. All who ask. All who ask. It's not talking about all men without exception, obviously. But he does give to all who ask. And he upbraids not. In other words, um, if you come to him and ask for wisdom, he's not going to say, what are you doing asking for wisdom? A sinful and inconsistent and contradictory and hypocritical as you are, you ask me for wisdom? So, no, no, Lord doesn't do that. Any human being would, but not the Lord. He gives to all liberally, generously, graciously. And he doesn't upbraid. He doesn't bawl you out for asking. What an encouragement to ask. Verse 6, but let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. There's only one way to ask the Lord for anything. Let him ask in faith. What's that mean? Let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. Now, the word wavering is doubting. And this is not the word used when our Lord said, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Different word. This is not the word used when it says concerning all the disciples at the end, after the Lord was resurrected, they worshipped him and some doubted. That's not the word because where those men had that doubt, they also had faith. They believed. And when James says, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, nothing doubting, he's speaking of that doubt which is from unbelief. The word waver. Turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Hold your finger there in James 1. We're coming right back there. We turn to Romans chapter 4. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father. I have made thee a father of many nations. Now, when the Lord made that statement to Abraham, he didn't have any kids yet. God doesn't say, I will make you a father of many nations. He said, I have made you 
a father of many nations. When God says something, it is before it takes place. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens. Here's who God is, the one who quickens the dead, gives life to the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. It could just as accurately and perhaps more accurately be translated. He calleth those things which be not as be. That's so uh, glorious with regard to justification. I'm not justified in myself. God says I am, I am. That's how clear that is. Let's go and read him. Verse 18, who against hope, there wasn't any hope that he could have a child uh, he was 100 years old, his wife was 90, and had already gone through menopause. There was no hope that he would have a child. Humanly speaking, there was no hope. Who, against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He didn't even take those things into account because of what God said. That's all it took is a word from God. Everything else said no. But God said, that means yes. He staggered not. That's the word wave, waver. That's the word waver. Same word. He staggered not, he wavered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded. And that word persuaded is in the passive tense. You know what that means? The reason he was fully persuaded is because God persuaded him. And that's why he was fully persuaded. If God persuades you, you'll be fully persuaded. If I persuade you, You'll have all kinds of question marks. But if he persuades you, you'll be fully persuaded. And what was he fully persuaded of? That what God had promised, he was able. He was able. Is anything too hard for the Lord? He was able to perform. Before you go back to James, I'd like to look to, with me at 1 Kings chapter 18. We'll get back to James, but I want us to look at this passage of Scripture in 1 Kings chapter 18. This is Elijah, and he says in verse 21, And Elijah came unto all the people. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? That is the double-minded man. How long halt ye between two opinions? Opinions. And that word halt means jump back and forth. Straddle the fence. Go to one side, then to the other. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, you know, uh, Elijah's name means Jehovah is God. And I'm sure that that was just a source of irritation to Ahab at this time. He was worshiping Baal. And this man whose name Jehovah is God that he was denying is speaking. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. 
Don't halt between two opinions. Don't go back and forth. Don't be a double-minded man. Don't be unstable like Reuben. How long halt ye between two opinions? Now, 40 years ago, one of the first services we ever had at Todd Road Grace Church, Henry Mahan preached a message entitled Six Stubborn Statements. And he preached an hour and a half. And nobody was upset with it. The, the, how you know that? Well, we, that's back when we had cassette tapes. One 45-minute side went through. The other 45-minute side through, through, you heard the click. And he was going on after that. Um, and it usually, if I preached an hour and a half, I imagine I'd be pinching, preaching to empty pews by now. Everybody get up and walk out. But it was a, it was a great, great message. But uh, in these six stubborn statements, and I think this has something to do with halting between two opinions. Um, but I'm going to add one to it, the first one. And then we'll look at his six stubborn statements. Either the Bible is the inspired word of God, or it's not. Either the Bible is God's word, our only rule of faith and practice. The inspired word of God, each word said exactly as God would have it said. Every verb tense, every plural, every pronoun, every everything is exactly as God would have it said. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, believe all of it or believe none of it. It doesn't do any good to say, I believe the Bible is the word of God, not paying attention to what it says. <laughs> there are a lot of people who will fight for the Bible being the inspired word of the scriptures. They pay absolutely no attention attention to what it actually says and so all these other everything else comes out of this to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word it's because there's no light in them this is the religion of this book the bible the holy scriptures now in giving these you can't really have the first six statements without that. And I'm sure he, you know, I'm not adding anything he said. That was in, in, in that. But we've got to begin here. The Bible's the word of God. Here is his first statement. God is either sovereign in his will or man is sovereign in his will. God is either God, absolutely sovereign, in control of everything, or man has a free will, and he's the one who's sovereign, and he's the one whose will is ultimately done. Which is it? It can't be both. You can't halt between two opinions. God is either God, absolute, sovereign, in complete control, or he's not, and he's got to wait to see what man will let him do. Set stubborn statement is men are either dead in sins, incapable of saving themselves, and totally dependent upon a sovereign God, or men have some ability to save themselves. And salvation actually is ultimately dependent upon works. It's one of the two, but it can't be both. You can't halt between two opinions. The one excludes the other. The third stubborn statement was God either elected a people before time began or he didn't. Now, if he did, the people who don't preach this are lying on God. If he didn't, the people who do preach this are lying on God. And don't hide behind the refuge of, well, you know, it's a doctrine of secondary importance. I've heard people do that. It's a doctrine of secondary importance. It's not really that important. Well, if God's glory is not important, it's not important. And he said his glory was, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. 
and I'll show mercy to whom I will show mercy. God is either God, that's what that means, he elected people. Election is God being God. Or the other is true, and men are the one really in control. The fourth stubborn statement, God's either sovereign or he's not. Men are either dead or they're not. God either elected the people or they're not. And the fourth stubborn statement had to do with the death of Christ. Christ's blood either actually saves and puts away sin, or it doesn't, and it's up to men to do something to make it work. One is true, the other is false. One is the content of the gospel, the other is a false gospel. There's no mixing of the two. Fifth, God the Holy Spirit, this is that fifth stubborn statement, God the Holy Spirit either irresistibly and invincibly gives life or he's got to wait to see if a man will let him give him life. Two things can't be brought together, can they? How long halt ye between two opinions? And the last stubborn statement was God's people either persevere all the way to the end looking to Christ only. And I'm saying this about perseverance. Perseverance isn't remaining religious. A lot of people remain religious. But you persevere in looking to Christ only all the time or men can fall away and not be saved, which would deny everything the Bible teaches. Turn back to James. How long halt ye between two opinions? The instability of Reuben is what got me thinking this way. James chapter 1. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, not hopping back and forth, not holding two opinions. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Now that double-minded man will not receive anything from the Lord. And here's why. He doesn't have faith. That's why. Without faith, the scripture says, it is impossible. Not hard, not unlikely, without faith. And what is faith? <clears throat> faith is knowing that Jesus Christ is your righteousness before God, and you rely on him. You don't look anywhere else. <coughs> without faith, it is impossible to please God. Let that, not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. And then James, and I have no doubt that Reuben was one of the people in mind that made him say this, a double-minded man is unstable. Remember Reuben? Unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable, frothy in all his ways. Ways. Now that word double minded. Double mindedness excludes faith. It's not weak in faith, it's without faith. You can be saved having weak faith. As a matter of fact, you're saved the same way the man with strong faith is. You're saved by Christ, not by your faith. You see, it's the object of faith that saves, not the faith itself. It's the object. You can have the weakest faith in the world and be saved just as surely as the strongest faith in the world. So this is not talking about weakness of faith. It's double-minded man. It's talking about absence of faith, double as opposed to single. Paul put it this way, I fear lest by any means as, as uh, Satan tempted Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the 
And by another word, simplicity. The onlyness. The onlyness of Christ. That's what Paul feared. That's what I fear for myself every day. That's what I fear for you every day. Being corrupted from the simplicity, the onlyness of Christ. Now I'm going to uh, wind up this message with something that's familiar, I believe, to all of us. It is um, what is known as the um, five solas. And we went over them in Sunday school recently. It's what we went over with the Vacation Bible School. But I, I want to I wanna mention these again. Scriptures alone, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, the glory of God alone. And these have been called uh, the watchwords of the Reformation. And I hate it when they're called that because they're not the watchwords of the Reformation. They're eternal truth. This was true before time began. This was true when God created the universe. This was true when Adam fell. These are not things that happened during the Reformation. As far as that goes, I don't even like to talk about these being the, the Reformed faith. Reformed from what? The truth never needed to be reformed. Now understand that. The truth's always been pure. It's always been glorious. It never needed reformed. That's one of the reasons why I really dislike the term Reform faith. You know, when people say, are you reformed? I, no. I believe sovereign grace. But as far as the, the thought of the reform, reform from what? What do, did it, was it down here and all of a sudden we've made it more pure and we brought it back to light? God's never been without witness. He's always had his witness. He's always had the truth. So this is eternal truth. Scriptures alone. Christ alone. Grace alone, faith alone, the glory of God alone, no instability, no hopping back and forth. Scriptures alone, every word of the Bible. Now, you'll notice we do not have a confession of faith. We don't have one. You know why? We got the Bible. <laughs> That's simple enough, isn't it? We got the Holy Scriptures. Any document written by man is uninspired. Why would I want to look to something uninspired? We have God's holy word. The scriptures alone. Our only rule of faith and practice. If it's not in the Bible, I don't want to hear it. And if it's what the Bible teaches, I want to hear. And the thing that is, somebody says, well, you know, the Bible is a big book. Yeah, it's a big book, but it's got one message. That's not complicated. You don't have two things to choose from. It's the gospel. It's the gospel of God's grace. It's the gospel of Christ. Scriptures alone. And I stand on that. I, I just, I, I, I have such confidence in the word of God. This is the inspired word of God. And I would never ask anybody to believe me anything I say because I said it or because this church believes or because some kind of denominational distinctions. Denominations aren't in the Bible. Scriptures alone. Christ alone. He is the message of every scripture. I believe that. I know that's what Paul meant when he said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Christ alone is the message of Scripture. This book has one purpose, to reveal Jesus Christ. It testifies with regard to him. He claimed that. He said, you search the scriptures in them, you think you have eternal life. You think, oh, if I can just learn how to live and how to conduct my life through reading the Bible. I'm all for conducting your life in a good way. I'm all for me conducting my life in a good way. I'm not diminishing that, but I'm saying this. The scripture is given to teach who he is, what he did, where he is now, 
the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of every scripture. Doesn't matter what it is. It's to teach us the gospel. And I, I know that Christ alone is the object of faith. Christ alone, not Christ and. I know Christ alone is the ground of assurance. Not Christ and. Not Christ and how I'm living. I want to live in a way that glorifies God. Please don't misunderstand me. I want to live a way that glorifies Christ. I want to live in a way, I want to be an example in all things. I'm not taking away from that. Don't misunderstand me. But I don't look to anything that I do, think, desire. My only ground of assurance is that Jesus Christ died for me. I have no other ground. And if I make anything else a ground, I've made that anti-Christ. That's what I've done. Christ alone. Grace alone. From election to final glorification and everything in between salvations by grace. Not of works. Now here's what that means. When you begin in your experience of salvation... It's because of the grace of God. It's not because of anything you've done. It's because God saved you. Amen? You know that's so. The Lord did something for you. And in the middle of your experience here on earth, it's just as much grace now as it was then. And you can't say, well, I was started by grace, but I started doing better. No. No. If you say that, that's works. It works. If at the end you say, well, salvation is by grace, and grace kept me, but there at the end I'm going to be rewarded a higher place because of my works of obedience. Well, if you deserve something, I hope you get it. <laughs> but um, uh, we all know better than that. Uh, the thought of rewards for human works, what about you would add something to the righteousness of Christ and make, make it better? No. Salvation is by grace alone. Faith alone. Not faith and. If it's faith and, it's not faith. Faith alone. The one evidence of salvation. I love that passage of scripture in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and I don't know how many times I've, I've only read half of this. Let a man examine himself. Note, let a man examine himself, not somebody else. Let a man examine himself, whether he be in the faith. That's what I want to examine. Whether I be in the faith. The faith, the faith of God's elect, the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. The one evidence of salvation is faith in Christ. And if I make anything else an evidence, I make it anti-Christ. That's strong language. I believe it with all. I know it's so. The glory of God alone is the only motive God operates on. Now, when God saved me, it wasn't his response to me. It was him glorifying himself. And in my salvation and in everybody else's salvation, he gets all the glory. And we love it that way. And the reason we love it that way is not only because all glory goes to him, but because if there's any glory that goes to us, that makes salvation by grace go out the door. And I, I've got to come up with some kind of work. That's why I'm so, I, I, I actually have a selfish motive, as I, as I do in everything else. But I have a selfish motive and want it to be for the glory of God alone. Because if it's not, I'm in trouble. 
Double-minded, Reuben, unstable as water, you shall not excel, double-minded in all his ways. May the Lord give us grace to be single-minded. Let's pray. Lord, we ask in Christ's name that you would bless your word to us and that we would not be double-minded, unstable as water. Deliver us from being corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. For Christ's sake. Lord, as we prepare to take your table in obedience to your command, truly give us the grace to do this in remembrance of thy dear son. In his name we pray.